Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Amber Barton and I'm the HTV Potatoes Knowledge Exchange Manager for the East Midlands region. Uh, today we've got the second part of our desiccation focused webinars um, and if you've missed the first uh, then you can catch up with it on, on our HTV YouTube channel. Uh, next slide, slide, slide please Christian. So firstly I'm going to run through a bit of housekeeping with you. Um, everybody's in UCIS um, and we can't see or hear anything, so don't worry. <laughs> um, any questions for the speakers, or if you're having any technical issues, there's a box on the right-hand side of your screen um, where you can type messages to us. Uh, questions will be saved for the Q&A session at the end, um, and if you've got technical issues, Christian will uh, endeavour to solve them in the background. Uh, basis and Enroso points are available. So if you go into that question box again and just enter your name, postcode, date of birth and basis and Enrosa number, we'll make sure that those get sorted for you. Uh, the webinar is being recorded um, and will be added to the HDB YouTube site before lunchtime tomorrow. So if you need to nip off uh, for any reason or you know someone who hasn't been able to join, um, then don't worry about that. Uh, if you've got any feedback on this webinar or future webinar ideas, um, then please let us know because it will help to shape our programme going forward. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. Uh, so I'm joined today by Mark Fellon, Will Gag, Mike Shapland, Ollie Blackburn, and Jim Reed. I have to make sure I get everybody in there. <laughs> uh, first, we're going to have a quick look at a video that's been done on the last week or so uh, over at Jim's farm uh, up in Scotland. Then I'm going to hand over to Mark. Uh, who's going to run us through this year's desiccation trials on the spot farms uh, before we have a discussion uh, with some of our current and previous strategic potato farm hosts um, and find out how they're tackling the challenge of desiccation without dicot this year. Um, after this, we'll open the floor to questions um, and find out uh, what's going on with everybody else as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Without further ado, I'll hand over to the video. <laughs> Behind me is our desiccation uh, plots. This is looking at the time of year where you're trying to kill down the uh, plants. It's a tricky job to do because you've got a, a plant that's growing quite vigorously and you need to stop growth quite quickly to get seed potatoes that are fit and healthy for next year's farmers to plant again. The plots that we have here are um, uh, field scale plots, but we also have replicated plots over the other side, which are our AHDB replicated desiccation plots and we, we look not only at um, chemical control but we also look at mechanical control. The desiccation part of the seed pro process is a, a quite a big uh, influence on the following season's crop so depending on what desiccation treatment has been followed and how well it's been carried out uh, has a, does uh, make a difference in next year's crop. Certain methods uh, I'm a bit old-fashioned, uh, flailing in a seed crop was always frowned upon for spreading uh, pectobacterium and I think although flails are better than they used to be, uh, I think if there is uh, black leg present in a crop uh, it needs to be assessed as to whether you do use a flail to, in the desiccation process. It's definitely varietal, variety specific. Uh, I've seen a difference this year. Innovator, which you can see at the far side there, uh, that was desiccated probably, I think, 10 days before this crop. But we have Innovator in other fields and they've been very easy to, you know, cope quite happily without Diquat and Innovator. But the daisy that's at the other end there, I must admit that I was a bit nervous last week when I was putting on the T3, but thankfully it's, uh, it's worked. These are all the AHDB replicated trials. Uh, it's all done by hand. I think these trials are really important that uh, we'll look at all the different treatments in a, a replicated forum like this that uh, then we know gives us an idea how we move on to the field scale trials that we do ourselves. These trials will be just like our own, they'll, they'll 
uh, they'll all be harvested and they'll be assessed for passive bulking. Obviously for seed growers we're, we're interested in uh, stopping them as quickly as we can uh, because we have this, a seed fraction uh, generally 50 or 55 mil top riddle. Uh, so it's important that we get the timing right when we're, uh, when we're giving them their first treatment. I think there's a lot of innovative uh, treatments here. There's a he that we see a, saw a huge difference in the pelagronic acid this year just because we actually mechanically tilted the crop so that the pelagronic acid was going on the underside of the leaf rather than the top of the leaf. And it's night and day the difference in between last year and this year. And it actually stands out as one of the better treatments this year and that was the only difference. The desiccation treatment has a, ultimately has an effect on the next crop. Uh, with different levels of black leg and this year, although we haven't seen leaf roll for 20 years, as a result of the desiccation trials, we've shown that the treatments that were slower uh, have a higher level of virus. Losing chemistry, you know, we're going to be under increased pressure, so we'll have to do everything we can to alleviate that. Personally, uh, if we can do it without a flail, it definitely speeds up harvest. I think on our soil types, and I emphasise that, it's, uh, we've, uh, there's clay in our soils. Uh, where the flail has been, then it compacts the side of the rows, and creates clods. I think we've shown this year that while we've, we've got regrowth in four of the flailed green treatments. So we used car carfentrazone as a, as a T1 and uh, left flailing it green seems to give the plant the wrong message. It's given it a growth spurt uh, rather than a chemical treatment that's actually shutting the, telling the plant to shut down to start senescing. So that's just a snapshot of what we've got to come and uh, I'm going to hand over to Mark Stalham now who's going to take you through some more of the uh, trial results uh, so far in a bit more detail. Uh, thank you Amber. Um, welcome everybody. I don't know how many people we've got out there. Um, what we're going to talk about is basically an extension of some things that we introduced a month ago on a similar webinar. Um, I'm going to just basically give an outline of what we were attempting to do in 2020 and then give you an update of where we are on two of the earliest sites on the spot uh, east and the spot north desiccation trial. So Christian who's in control of this, um, if we can have the next slide please. So an aim was basically set in 2019 to find alternatives to diquat for desiccation. We haven't had it as a product this year, so effectively in the second year of trials. And you can see the smaller font there at the bottom is, is basically how do we manage canopy nitrogens to get the most efficient use of what might be a poorer product in terms of desiccation. Next slide, please, Christian. So you can see the sites there. We've got Jim with us today at the Spot Scotland site, um, a seed farm with a crop of daisy. We've got Mike Shacklin at the opposite end of the country with a ware crop of Lenorma. Um, we've got the Cirque site uh, managed at Mike's at um, a Royal site in, uh, in the southwest, sorry, in the west, and then the Spot North with, with Will Gag, um, which is a Maris Piper crop following on from what we had last year. Okay, next slide, please. So the treatments that we've got here um, are basically eight. You will see in a moment, that, as Jim has alluded to, they're all replicated small plot, i.e. four rows by eight meters in length. Um, and they've got a number of combination treatments. The combination treatments are effectively a factorial design with uh, a reduced rate of nitrogen of um, 15%, um, where we're actually applying 15% less nitrogen than the recommended rate for the variety and the intended use of the crop. So we've got a control which is nothing applied. We've got the spotlight gozai combinations. So spotlight one litre per hectare, followed by gozai a period later, in this case seven days, followed by spotlight. And we've then got a fourth treatment which has been used on two of the sites, the Spot Scotland seed site and the Ware site, 
over in the west where we apply a second dose of Gaizai again at 0.8 litres. Uh, we then move on to the flail which is basically at RB209 level and then we've got the uh, treatment that you heard there, the pelagonic acid aka final san as its trade name. Um, we've got their standard rate of nitrogen and obviously they're a, a rate that's much higher um, in relation to spotlight or goes eye at 1 or 0.8 litres per hectare. At that point, I must say that all of the treatments were applied from one to six, or from, sorry, from three to six in 400 litres of water volume as spray through knapsack sprayers effectively. And the Soltex treatments are, are basically a mimicking of what we tried in 2019, but with a rate of half of what we applied in 2019. So you can see there, it's a very high rate at 562 litres per hectare, but that is the one treatment that actually was higher than 400 litres per hectare. So you can see the timings there in general, the T1, T2 sprays were seven day intervals. Most of the sites have been able to get certainly through T2 and possibly into T3 at those recommended intervals. But as the weather's changed, it's become more difficult to spray either through rain or wind. And sometimes the, the intervals changed either shorter or longer to not quite make those three or seven day intervals. OK, next slide, please. So what we've got here is very simply, you've got a site here with a site plan, the treatments, and you can see the replicated plot experiments there. And the green plots there are the ones that have received the standard rate of nitrogen. So the standard protocol, different randomization for every site, but same layout. Okay, next slide, please. So what we've got here is, is the crop of Mike Chaplin's um, field down in Sutton in Suffolk, crop of Lenorma. And in conversation with Mike, basically, we found that we actually had to take this crop forward by about two and a half weeks against our original intended date. You can see the stage of crop growth there. Um, this was basically a day um, when the temperature was 31 degrees. We sprayed our T1 application there, and you'll see the consequence of that. So already our, our site was well ahead of plans. And pretty much all of the sites have been ahead of the plans and we'll, we'll cover that with Jim when we get back to a discussion on the Scottish side in, in, in terms of seed. So next slide please. So what we've got here is looking down on the crop, you'll see some pictures of ground cover. This is the crop effectively at 96-97% ground cover, you can see the green leaf area there. So we started off with a crop that was almost complete cover before we applied our T1 sprays. Next slide, please. Okay, so you will see pictures from the video and a little bit later. This was the flail treatment. You can see there we've got some erect stems. We've also got some stems that are a little bit horizontal, but generally we got a sort of cut between four inches and, and eight inches in length, um, but the crop was relatively squat and, 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 and short. So we didn't manage to get any really long stems lodging in the wheelings, which we couldn't pick up with the flare. Next slide, please. So this is the time course here, and there's two points here. Very simply, the flail, you can see the orange line, killed the crop in terms of leaf cover almost instantaneously. We removed 95 to 100% to, to of the leaves with the flail and just left the stems. The control, which is the blue and the green line, that clearly are different to the rest of the, of, of, the, of the crops. And it does show you there that the green line is the crop with 15% less nitrogen than the RB209. So it started with only about 80% ground cover as opposed to 96%, and it dropped more rapidly. And it maintained that sort of difference of 15% right down until about two weeks after we'd actually got um, the T1 sprays applied. From that point onwards, there was a vestigial ground cover maintained right through until four weeks after the T1. But if you look at all the other treatments, there's the similar approach that reduced nitrogen, no matter what the chemical control, did leave the crop with about 15% less, less foliage to deal with when we applied either our spotlight or our Soltex treatments. So you can see there, nitrogen was having an effect in terms of the canopy that was required to be killed. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the treatments at three weeks after T1 application. And you can see there the controller's got about six or 7% ground cover in the bottom left of that ground cover grid. 
all of the other treatments other than the spotlight goes on, which just happens to have um, a, a volunteer cereal coming up post-spraying, all of them are actually dead and the stems are brittle mostly or certainly bleached and no green stems. So you can see there what we were like three weeks after and pretty much the same after two weeks as you can see from the previous slide on ground cover. Okay, next slide please. So this is stem desiccation and what I'm going to do now is just present some slides where if the colour of the numbers are different, then the treatments are statistically significant difference with the rest of the bulk. So what you can see here is that the controls, the ones that have nothing applied, basically have far more green stems and fewer bleached and brittle stems than the control treatments, uh, sorry, the, the spray treatments or the flail treatments, which were all largely similar. So despite those small differences, very much everything that was applied or applied mechanically did the job in terms of stem desiccation. And often leaf, leaves die rapidly, but it's the stems that are more difficult to desiccate. In this case, within three weeks, and certainly four weeks, we got a very, very good kill of stems. Next slide, please. So interestingly, you'll see in a moment what we use to assess skin set to mimic harvesting. But last year, um, basically, Bill Watts trialed a torque screwdriver with a one centimetre diameter wooden dowel effectively embedded in a torque head. The pool there you can see is using to remove the skin on a random position on the tuba at various times during the season. So we're trying to use this as whether a grower could actually use this to predict when his crop was ready for harvesting. So we've got some interesting data from all of the sites. We've analysed two and you'll see the next slide shows these data. Next slide, please. So what we've got here is basically a time course of the torque screwdriver and pretty much what you're seeing is very low numbers, but these are in Newton meters, which is what it reads out. But as a numerical number, we're looking for mid teens on these numbers, i.e. 0.15 or above to be skin set that we think would be close to harvesting. So you can see there that the control in red never reaches it. Um, interestingly, we might pick up on this that the control without nitrogen or reduced nitrogen actually is slower in apparently setting skins, according to these numbers, than the standard control, which we can pick up in the discussion. But all of the rest of the treatments that we apply do lead to skin set around about uh, three weeks after that we get um, uh, T1 application. So they're all just about got there three weeks later. But how does that relate to the actual skinning? Next slide, please. So what we do is we insert the tubers into a barrel. Um, we turn them around there for two minutes with water to mimic being banged around on a harvester. And the yellow stuff you see is coarse anti-slip sandpaper that abrades the tubers. Pretty aggressive, but it mimics what a harvester will do in two minutes according to you know, the, the vigors that would go over a commercial harvest. Next slide, please. So these pictures are quite small. They're small for me. They may be even smaller on your screen, but there will be images on the control side where there are little flecks of skin. You can particularly see a tuber um, that's in the midpoint um, of the screen. I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not, probably not, but the picture in the middle row has got a little fleck of skin whereas the crop on the right, which is basically skin set, is the spotlight goes eye spotlight combination with the standard level of nitrogen. So low levels of skinning, this was three weeks after we applied our T1. So next slide, please. So these are the summary of the data. Again, look at the numbers in terms of the differences. So the red numbers are significantly different from the rest. And what we're aiming for here is a surface area removed less than 15% to allow that crop to be harvested under the normal conditions. Because our cement mixer is very aggressive, we can accept that level of skinning before a harvest would really give us some serious problems. So what you can see here is that three weeks after T1, we've only got 1.75 or 1.55% of skin removed, which is about a tenth of what we would expect to go over the harvest. So these crops are ostensibly set skin. So if we go to four weeks, the numbers have gone down, but numerically, um, we've still got these control treatments actually significantly poorer in terms of the overall chemical and flail, which are all identical. 
So effectively, they've all got there after three weeks. It would have been interesting perhaps to try these crops after two weeks, but that wasn't in the protocol. But certainly some of the crops that were sprayed were getting close to skin set after two weeks, which mimics some of the work that we produced in 2019, which we'll come back to. Okay, next slide, please. So we move on to Will Gag's site, who's going to be on the panel today with, with Mike. Um, we've got here Maris Piper. This is the crop basically not at the stage of desiccation, but a week later. So you can see it's beginning to senesce. This is one of the better pictures I've got of the whole site. Okay, next slide, please. So this is pre-application. Um, basically, um, two weeks after we applied the chemical at the spot east site, but you can see it's distinctly yellow. We can see patches of ground opening up. So the crop is definitely on that point of active senescence where we should ostensibly get good kill. Next slide, please. So here's the flail, um, more longer stems, more difficult to pick up. You can see the wheelings there, which we remarked on in, in 2019, and we will return to in the forum discussion at the end. But, you know, good cover. We've got some leaf material still on the stems, but, uh, you know, largely the stem length is, is, is pretty short, if not that uniform. Okay, next slide, please. So a ground cover time course again, same thing again, the two control treatments with high and low nitrogen, follow the same pattern. So reducing the nitrogen level by 15% um, really hasn't had much effect on, on actually affecting the canopy. So we'll talk about that again with Will, what his rates of nitrogen in particular have, have done through the spot farm program. But basically everything else dies pretty rapidly. And you can see there, most of the treatments are less than 10% ground cover, only 10 days after the application of a T1 treatment. And by three weeks later, that almost all are dead. But still some vestigial ground cover remains on those untreated crops right through until almost the beginning of September. Next slide, please. So again, similar pictures before, you've got the control treatment there with estimation with no grid, probably around about 15% ground cover, 10 or 15%. All of the other treatments dead and looking pretty similar no matter what we did. And obviously the flail, you've seen that, that was dead. Um, um, after the first week of, of application of that, that treatment. Next slide, please. So here we've got the stem desiccation. Again, the green, uh, sorry, the blue numbers are significantly different to the red numbers. So all of the chemical and all the mechanical treatments are pretty similar and not significantly different in terms of stem desiccation. But you can see the controls that were left to do nothing, despite them dying reasonably rapidly, were still had appreciable green stems at three weeks after T1 application. So next slide, please. So here's the time course of screwdriver. Again, we're looking for this 0.15. And if we look there, uh, basically 15 days after the T1 application, we were getting all of our chemical treatments meeting that sort of rough caveat of being able to be put over a harvester with minimal damage in terms of scuffing whereas the two control treatments still weren't ready two weeks after that. And we're still waiting for the data to come through from the, the later, later treatments on, on here. So, you know, these are a snapshot of where we are. Next slide, please. So this is the skin set. And what I did, I, I, I gave Christian and Amber um, a very quick update this morning on where we were in relation to 2019. And you can see the skin set bear in mind we need to be below 15% in that cement mixture, then basically most of the treatments are in the four to, sorry, three to, to 5% skinned at three weeks after T1 after T1 application, all of them have reached there, but even the controls have reached there. If you look at what we did in 2019, you can see they're slightly higher, but basically both of these crops of Maris Piper on a similar site have, have died very rapidly on application of the T1 spray or have died rapidly despite doing nothing. So we timed these treatments almost perfectly, but we've had crops that have been on that point of active senescence when we've applied. Next slide, please. So just one more data. We've got a few more pieces of data coming in. We've got some data from Spot West. If you go through to the next slide, you can see where we are there, that basically the chemical treatments have got a time course of three measurements. They're all beginning to die rapidly. 
they're all dead effectively within two weeks of a T1 application. And this is a crop of royal that looked like a trippid when we took photos earlier in the season, but has reacted quite significantly to the very high temperatures and the sort of stress levels that we had in late July. And the crop was brought forward again by two weeks in terms of its predicted target for desiccation. But you can see there, unlike the other crops, this crop has still got nearly 50% ground cover or slightly more where we didn't apply a chemical control. So the chemicals have worked in this case um, in terms of comparing the control. Next slide, please. And that is the summary of the results in 2020. So what Amber has asked me to do now is basically to get all of the spot farm hosts to unmute their audio and turn on their videos so that we can have a discussion and hopefully um, Will's joined us, Mike's joined us, you'll see all the people that should be joining and we've got all five people. So what I'm going to do is basically ask the panel a series of questions, some of them have worked and some will be new and we'll develop a conversation. We'll carry that on for about another 15 minutes or so. Um, but in the meantime, could people that are viewing online please go to the, um, the chat line and feed in questions through the written forum and then they'll be policed by Christian and Amber so that we can have a question and answer session that can carry on for about quarter past four. So, Will, the first question I want to ask you is 2019, um, we had a demonstration at the Spot Farm North site where you were trialling three um, flails and I gather from the results of those trials, um, you chose to purchase a flail in 2020. Maybe you could give us some indication of why you chose a flail as opposed to a chemical, um, straight chemical uh, treatment, and what, why you chose the particular one you did and for some reasons. Yeah, well, basically, it was actually four different machines we tested. Um, and uh, yeah, basically decided to go down the route of um, flail because basically just felt that we couldn't rely on the area we had on chemical, just basically, you know, would it kill things in time? Um, skin set for the, um, certainly for the area we had to lift. Um, so we, it was quite early on we, we decided um, no matter what, we were going to be buying a flail. Um, as far as actual products, we actually went with the Scots, um, just pure and simply built in England. Um, it did a fantastic job with felt. Um, it was front and rear mounted, so it actually balanced on the tractor a bit better for weight distribution. Um, but yeah, basically down to the two thing, two things is basically um, uh, the job it did, and um, well, sorry, three things actually price. Um, and the fact it was built relatively locally. Um, so, yeah, that's why I went down those routes. Okay, and, and we know the issues that we had with compaction because I was wet with you when we'd have a big a dump of rainfall on the T1 applications last year, and we could see the obvious effects of compaction. You can see them again this year from the, the tractor mounted flail. Were you, were you scared of that, and have you seen it this year? That has been our biggest, biggest problem with, with flailing, really. I mean, I've got no problems at all, really, effectively, for our wall soils types. Um, I'm not concerned <laughs> about that bit. Um, but really down the silt land, um, where, again, we've got it silt with clay, um, you get that compaction of the row sides, you get clods, um, greening issues, you know, after another heavy downpour, you know, some real proper roots can, can form. Um, that is still the bug there. We're having just to be basically quite canny of when we do go. I mean, we, we had quite a deluge of rain um, throughout the end of August. Um, and basically, we're just basically, you know, having to pick your timing of when to go on those soils. Um, but in all fairness, we have picked those times and we're not too bad. I can see a, a, a higher level of greening because of it, just where it's just taking odds and sods off the shoulders. Um, I'll be honest, we have we'll probably have lower greening from the top of the row because we've got the actual ridge rollers on there. But from the edge of the row, we're going to increase it. Um, but the increase, I think, is going to outweigh what we're gaining from the top. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Will. I mean, Jim, turning to you, which 
you know, the sort of answer you mentioned in your in your video presentation was, you know, sort of not anti-flail, but it very much that the risk of spreading pectobacterium and black leg into the crop is your system is is very much uh, uh, having to stop the crop dead. Could you explain why you know you've chosen not to go down the route of flail? And 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 Will's mentioned some some points about when you have a rainstorm. Perhaps you mentioned about the issues you might get following rainfall and exposure of the ridge. I think I just agree with everything that Will said. Uh, where the flail uh, has been working, one of the flail treatments that we had, we had a a quagmire at the bottom of the, of the three rows where when it's uh, treated chemically then you don't have the compaction, the, the water's able to drain away and that, that's there for the whole of the, the rest of the season. Um, obviously because we're seed growers uh, we don't want to be flailing if there's any black leg present in the crop and also the virus is an issue as well uh, and we've successfully, well I think successfully, done everything with uh, three sprays, two and three spray programs this year. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue about, um, you know, flailing would be, you were mentioning about in an earlier talk about preconditioning the foliage to die. So you, some of your issues with flail have been the regrowth that you experience on flailed treatments that have been flailed green. Would you sort of put some of the, maybe some of your theories about maybe a, a, a T1 spray followed by a flail to sort of get the crop in a, in a different condition? Yeah, uh, the four treatments that we have in our own trials this year uh, that were flailed green all had levels of regrowth in them. One in particular was was bad, it was uh, end to end, so it actually needed a fourth treatment to, to kill that regrowth. Now the regrowth, not only is it, uh, you know, it, it's a chance of having blight coming in, to the crop, but also uh, virus. We noticed from last year's trials, uh, we plant a ton out of the trials in the following season. And there was uh, one one treatment that we used last year had a quite an increased level of leaf roll in it. And honestly, we haven't seen leaf roll in a crop for 20 years. Uh, so it's important to, to get them uh, knocked down. But certainly our soil types, where the flail's been working, it, it just slows the harvest right down. It means that you need more aggressive separation on the harvester, which obviously in turn you're going to damage the potatoes as well. So it's it's not ideal. Okay. And, and is that something that happens across all varieties? Do you think that you could perhaps use a flail and not expect regrowth in maybe some of the more determinate group one varieties? Or would you yeah. say it's just across the board? Yeah. The regrowth was in Maureen, so that's a group three variety, so it's indeterminate. The, the innovator uh, was very easy, a group one variety, it was very easy to come down. Where we did use a T1 spotlight and followed the flail seven days later, there are absolutely no regrowth. So, you know, we're, we're trying to bring the crop down around growth stage 65. It was in full flower, you know, in, in contrast to the wear growers uh, whose crops are normally naturally senescing before they go in with their first treatment. So I, I think it's important that we need to try and shut the plant down. I think flailing green gives the, the plant the wrong message. It's given it a, a, a growth spot, if you like, rather than, than starting the the green uh, telephone box just to shut, tell it to shut down. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see when we harvest these individual treatments, how, how well they lift. Yeah. And, and, you know, sort of turning to Ollie, I mean, I know from our work with you at, uh, down in the spot southwest, you've got some varieties, perhaps the lecture would be a good example, where you've got indeterminate foliage and your your standard policy would be what? And, and, and how have you got on this season dealing with that variety? Maybe you'd run through a program of, you know, perhaps some of the nutrition that you've had difficulties with and how you've adjusted it. Yeah, I mean, we always had flailing as part of our program initially anyway, so we would have gone with diacorp, flailed, and then followed in with spotlight. Um, so our worry was this year, without having the diacorp, how effective we'd get at that kill. So the one thing that we targeted uh, with our agronomist was going out and and checking um, nitrogen levels in the soil before making the decision whether we would be topping up and to what level we'd be topping up with artificial fertiliser. Um, I'd say from what we've seen, We've had better senescence than we have done previous seasons on the back of that. Um, 
and this year we we went on and we 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 took the decision to um to to just go straight in topping them green and then followed up sort of four or five days later with a with a litre of spotlight um pleased with the results we've had a little bit of stole on damage which we don't know whether that was down to to the top of pulling pulling at the crop um but so far so good skin set in about 30 days and um we haven't had a stop in the harvesting yet so we've been pleased yeah so i mean that's a question for all of you you mentioned about the interval um between flailing and spraying um you were very much you said five days i mean uh turning turning to mike because mike hasn't asked a question yet, what would be your practice about flail and then spray the timing interval would it would it vary and what sort of things would you you think would influence that timing and it's a question for the other two guys jim and will as well so mike uh, generally we uh, we target about 48 hours between flailing and um, and spotlight application um so just a chance for that material to, to dry up and to desiccate and to make sure that we can get a good application on the stems. I mean, that, that's mitigated perhaps a little bit by, you know, logistics and when the sprayer is on, cut, you know, on spotlight, trying to fold cut work a little bit for him and, and minimise what and that sort of thing. But, but generally 48 hours is a lot of time. Will, do you want to answer? You know, 48 to 72 hours, we've, we've been baiting it ourselves. Um, very similar to Mike, basically, uh, um, letting the logistics and workload of the sprayer dictate for where, you know, to a certain degree of uh, where we are in there. But, uh, you yeah, know, so about 48, um, really just trying to let that stem just dry that a little bit um, and let conditions um, improve for actually hitting on that stem. Okay, and Jim? Yeah, generally, on the flailed green treatments that we did, it was three days uh, on the T1 uh, spotlight followed by the flail was seven days. And I think it was quite noticeable that the flail was marching on a, a easy another one and a half or two K faster than the crop that had had the, the T1 treatment. Okay, good. So uh, we talked about right at the beginning about managing nutrition. Ollie's picked up on it about being smarter and sampling the soil where we may have an undetermined nutrient content from maybe you know organic matter addition like cow manure. Um, you know, one of the things that is interesting is that the work we do in spot farm is that the effect on yield is relatively small from a reduction of nitrogen, but would that be an, uh, an influence in terms of desiccation? So all of you are sort of aware of what we've been doing on each of the sites that's a reduced rate of nitrogen. But maybe going to Mike, we had the trial in a field of commercial Denorma. Um, we recommended the rates for the for the trial and the reduction. Um, the lawn around, around the outside of the field did seem to live for another week, albeit not as long as perhaps either would have either of us would have liked. You know, did that crop receive any higher nutrition than the trial? Yes, it did. It had more nitrogen than the trial. Mark, yeah. So, yeah. And our, um, our, dis our discussions that we had, where we brought forward the desiccation date of the T1s from the middle of August right through to the end of July, um, your crop said, I don't think this is going to last. And it, it clearly didn't. But did you find the nitrogen kept that crop growing longer? And did it achieve what you wanted to in the end? Um, yeah. That so we kept it on for another week or so, another six to seven days, and yeah, the crop, the crop chicken budget in terms of yield. Um, but yeah, um, we had some background PCN present there, which um, was also having an effect on in that crop. Um, and yeah, part of that additional nitrogen, perhaps to just try and mitigate the effect of that uh, of that PCN as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, the crop did achieve budget. Yeah, and, and, and Jim, turning to you in Scotland, being, uh, you know, the shortest crop of any of the of the spot farm hosts in terms of trying to get it in out of the ground and out again at the other end of the season. Do you find anything in terms of varietal differences in terms of nitrogen on seed crops? Yeah, again, where we're uh, group three varieties generally get a little bit more nitrogen uh, around 80 or 90 mm -hmm. kilos. Royal and the uh, uh, innovator slightly, slightly less, but I think on the level of the nitrogen that we are using for seed crops is quite right. 
and, and, and Ollie, you know, we've worked with you with Electra, have had some of that that sort of information on nitrogen knocked on onto other crops, or it's clearly you're doing things about monitoring the crops to make sure that you've got the right nitrogen to get the crop through to the end of the season. So is, is, is that something you're doing regularly on all crops or is it just Electra? We we did it across the board. We sort of targeted fields that we uh, applied slurry to during the winter. Um, whereas previously we would have sort of taken a bit of account of that and um, and continued with uh, with um, with the application of the um, with the artificial. It does seem to have worked well. It took a bit of interpreting, but um, the agronomist sort of did did a good job on that for us. Okay, right. And one of the things that you know drawing towards the end of the bit, I've tried to tease out answers from you is that um, Mike um, and Jim, I'll put you on the spot as the two seed growers that. Um, Jim has alluded to about the passive bulking, i.e. Like trying to kill a seed crop dead so that you don't get any movement of tubers out of the upper limit of grades. You know, to, to, is that really the reason why you want to kill a crop dead um, immediately or is there a little bit of evidence that maybe we need to kill uh, the crop or virus or blight um, to, to do that? And, and how much evidence have you got for bulking beyond um, the level that a flail would do. So in other words, maybe some of the slower acting chemicals might give you a yield increase and a drop in marketable yield. So maybe Jim first. Definitely in the 10 years that we've been doing the trials, the, the flail green crops have always bulked more. There's, they've always had a, a lower seed con content than the other crops. So that's why I say that if they're flail green, it gives them a growth spurt. Uh, rather than shutting them down first, um, and because of last, we we had four treatments with pelagronic acid last year, and one of them was particularly slow with a low water volume, and we did have a higher level of uh, leaf roll in that particular treatment in the replanted crop. So, from a, a virus point of view, you know you want to get that green material uh, away. Yeah, yeah. Mike. Yeah, agree with Jim. Really, in terms of you know the, the aim is to remove that green material as quickly as possible to reduce the risk of any virus transmission um, and or blight. Blight tends to be lower risk for us in our climate, but virus is high risk. It's our biggest threat. Um, in terms of passive bulking, then yeah, we certainly do see it, um, more so in terms of um, crops that are less mature if you like at the point of flailing um, and also tends to be more of an issue with some of the um, less prolific tuber number crops so perhaps varieties like Marfona where we perhaps have lower tuber numbers you know fewer sinks within the plant then acid bulking can be a real issue there and we have to really scrutinize and be quite comprehensive in terms of regular testing and to make sure we get those timings right to be honest. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys, all the book. Um, we've sort of reached about a point where we said we'd open it up to the rest of the people on the call. And I can see from the WhatsApp group that we've got that there's quite a few questions. So maybe we can all stay on and then Amber joins us and she'll um, field the questions. I think perhaps David's joining as well. I don't know, but we'll let Amber decide. Hi, yep, yeah, um, just me, I think. I've got David in my ear as well, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, so we've got one question here, uh, which I'll start with, which is how important is desiccation strategy in preventing late ingress of PVY and PLRV? We've covered some of it already, but um, if there's anyone else that wants to chip in on that one. As chair, I probably think Mike and Jim might be the two guys to feel it. Well, definitely uh, we showed in the 10 different treatments that we had last year that we had varying uh, levels of uh, it was leaf roll actually uh, pvyn is one that we'll be looking for in the morning i'm pleased to say that sasa uh, belgium and uh, fmc are all very much on board with the work that we're doing and uh, sasa are taking uh, tuber samples from all of the treatments uh, which HDB are funding, they are also doing their own viro virologists are doing a, a best and a worst 
uh, Cheaper samples of the the best and the worst, which will give us a guide. And if there are uh, you know levels of uh, PVYN in the morine, then we'll not plant them. We'll not replant them. So you know we're conscious of uh, the responsibility we have in sending good seed south. You know it's uh, it's the only way that we can find out these answers. Mike, have you got anything to add? Not much more to that, really. I mean, we'll we'll watch with um, with interest, really, to see what results Jim gets and the different levels of bars, you know, following the different desiccation protocols, really. Um, but yeah, it just comes back to, um, in my opinion, that rapid destruction of green material is is the key. That's the that's the principal aim. If I move on to the next question, then, um, is there any data to show the effect of timing of applications and the weather? E.g., if applied on a hot sunny day at 10 a.m., we would expect to see a better result than applied on a dull day later in the day. Can we prove this, though? Um, I don't know if anybody's got any experience, maybe think, but certainly um, there's a few things going around on Twitter about low light levels under shade belts having significantly poorer kill with the same product being applied at the same time. We have more data this year from uh, the trial sites uh, with all the spray conditions. So we are pretty much able to show that some of the treatments I've shown today on the spot east site and the spot north site, the T1 applications were applied when it was 30 degrees light levels would be 28, 27 megajoules, which is very bright, and they've had an extremely good job. And Jim alluded to pelagonic acid. Interestingly, again, the two trials we've got, pelagonic acid is slower in killing the leaves. And I was quite interested in Jim, some of Jim's comments about targeting the underside of a leaf with final sand or pelagonic acid gave much more rapid kill. And it's things like that, that we're not just looking at the timing, it's, it's the rate of water and also, you know, where we target the sprays. So that's one of my comments. Um, maybe anybody else has got any information on that. And what would you do as best practice maybe for the four um, panellists? Any comments? I definitely think the spotlight for us went better in, in brighter conditions. We did a block of about 10, 15 hectares, which had to be sprayed in the dull conditions. And five, six days later, I did have my doubts whether we were going to have to follow it up with an additional spray. Uh, held our nerve and it seemed to pay off and, and it dug, dug on time. But it, it did give me, give me some cause for concern if we ended up in a very dull season without any following sunlight. I think I'll probably back that up. Um, we, we've certainly seen where places in certain variety, and I'd say many variety specific, where we've had to go back again. Um, certain varieties have had to, yeah, been no problem at all. But um, some, uh, we've certainly had to go back. Now, again, um, we've actually had to go back on what on varieties where they've been actually more naturally before they've even flailed. Um, the sort of more vigorously grow um, varieties, um, we've not really seen an issue, yeah, we've not seen much of an issue. But as far as sort of timing of that typical day and, you know, conditions, yeah, we've certainly seen a better kill, say, in the morning when it's been brighter um, than in a, in a dull and, yeah, dull afternoon, say. Yeah, similar for us really. We've generally been trying to target morning applications when it's been um, high light intensity, um, and we've been spoiled this season. Really, we've had good, hot, dry, bright conditions um, in abundance really to make these applications. So it hasn't been that much of a challenge. But yes, we do worry a little bit if you had a very dull and damp um, season overall with fewer bright, you know, sunny opportunities then. I think the effects would be uh, remarkably, you know, markedly down from what we've achieved this season. And, and I would, I'm not one of the, 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 the farmers involved in this, but um, David Furman's work with Syngenta and Reglone when it was basically being 
pushed out about split doses, we've done sequential timing treatments whereby half a litre of Reglone has been applied um, at sort of 11 o'clock in the morning to midday and has killed the crop almost dead. And we've done a similar treatment with three litres of Reglone and the crop still grew away from it on the same day in a very dull environment, same, effectively the same crop in terms of stage of growth. So, you know, it, it, it is conditions are crucial um, and you can get away with quite small doses of some products given the conditions are optimal. So that's just some feedback from historic work. Um, I've got a question I'm going to just fire in uh, to Jim based on something that was mentioned earlier on. It might have been in the video. Um, how do you target the underside of the leaf? I, uh, we noticed last year when we were doing the pelagronic acid uh, that the, the back frame of the sprayer uh, was, it was in, it, we could see it that night, we could see it different. Uh, but the rest of it, there was nothing, and it was evident after seven days that uh, you know they were still green, and it was only behind the sprayer. So this year, I actually tilted the crop with a roller that I use on the front of the sprayer for the oil seed rape when we're desiccating. Uh, and honestly, it's uh, it's just night and day. Uh, whether that's something that we're we're going to look at moving forward, it just depends the the different. Uh, chemicals that we're going to have uh, available to us but definitely I, I can see it in even the spotlight treatments that the tram lines are the behind the tractors definitely dried up quicker than the rest of the crop. I think where there's a non-flail uh, approach like we are uh, the spray the technology the nozzles uh, that you use we are, we bought a set of Lechler nozzles this year working them at four bar pressure and it was noticeable and the uh, treatment where we did the T1 with the, uh, I've disappeared, the T1 with the uh, spotlight followed by the flail. Um, the, the spotlight, it was actually right down to the bottom of the stems in there, uh, so we'd, we'd, we'd got really good penetration with, with that level of uh, pressure. I know when you're, it's, it's different on a flailed crop, I think you probably need a, a different nozzle type where it's flail, because it's a different, you're approaching a different target. But we actually use 400 litres at T1 and T2 this year because of the bulk of material that was there. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got another one here. Uh, what's the correct water rate to use in a crop already flailed? Um, or what are you using and how are you finding it? <laughs> it depends what's left. If it's an innovator, if there's, if there's not much left, then probably 200 litres is enough. You're putting on a more concentrated uh, spray at 200 litres. Uh, but in the mooring that we did, uh, our, our T2 was 400 and T3 was 300. Personally, we're basing most of ours around 300, Mark. Um, you know, a few were sort of knocking down to 250. Um, but again, a bit like Jim said, it all depends. And actually, you know, stems there and whether they're actually trying to make it a slightly more concentrated mix or not. Um, but yeah, we're basing ourselves around up to the 300 mark. I mean, I, I just like to add a comment that, that Jeff Field at Fields End did some work at Potatoes in Practice showing rates higher than 400. Uh, gave an increased rate of kill. I mean, have you ever tried anything higher than 400? Yeah, we did 600 and uh, marquees a number of years ago after talking to partly a German farmers and everyone uh, in mm -hmm. the group used 600 litres a hectare. And it did make a good job. Um, so, next question, has soil moisture deficit had any effect on time to skin set this year? Um, huge variation from the dry east uh, to the wet northwest. Um, I will start from what we've seen at the spot farms in that all of our sites pretty much were close to field capacity 
with Mike because Mike was irrigating the commercial crop. We were uh, desiccated and Mike sprayed the surrounding crop with irrigation almost immediately after um, we'd, we'd, um, we'd done our T1 treatment. So it wouldn't be far off field capacity, it would be a sort of 20 mil deficit, um, but it wasn't bone dry. And from Will's site, looking at it when T1s were applied and the flare was on, it was pretty close to field capacity, albeit the weather was very warm. So does that back up, Will and Mike, what, what were happening at both sites? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah it was. Yeah. We, the general view was, I think I wrote in the report last year, was that last year all of the sites were at field capacity when we did our desiccation just because of the weather that turned in August. Um, and therefore, we would expect skin set to be slower in wet soils, everything else being the same. And this year, we're probably slightly drier soils, yet the two data sets I've got that have been delivered back to me are actually showing faster skin set than last year because we got very good light levels um, and the crop in the right stage of growth. Now, I haven't got anything back from Jim's site yet, but we know that site and the, the Spot West site have had T4 applications applied because the crop has been very slow in setting skin. So, Jim, would you, you have field capacity values i think you got rain after the t1 didn't you got some rain after the the t1 and then there was a deluge after after the t2s um the, the the where it had been done with the knapsack sprayers definitely wasn't as as good a job as the commercial uh crop was because i think they use all four nozzles and they have to walk through twice to get a 400 liters and uh, where we're own crop, uh, the commercial crop side by side was much further on than uh, where the, the HDB trials were. So I think it shows that uh, the, the replicated trials are really important at, in comparing one another. But I think the commercial treatment is, is uh, superior to the, to the, the way that the, the trials are applied. <laughs> Um, so I've just seen a comment come in um, referring to one of the questions we've already discussed. So Gareth Jones from FNC uh, says, water volumes we've tested up to 600 litres per hectare with spotlight. Uh, performance has improved up to 450 litres per hectare, but then it flatlines. So another comment from the floor. Um, next question. So referring to the time of uh, the time to spray following a flail, does anyone still have nozzles on the back of the flail? Um, and spray it immediately behind the discs. No, um, we don't. We've moved away from that. But, um, yeah, my personal view is I want to see some some drying up of that flail material, um, just to make sure that we can get a good application of the spotlight onto the uh, r remaining stem, basically. Um, so yeah, for me, 48 hours really is the minimum to let that dry up. I'd back that up. You know, it, it, uh, if we were to be turning, you know, having a nozzle around the back, I just don't think it, uh, um, the effectiveness of the chemical, I just don't think it'll be there. Um, just seeing what, say, called trash is around on that stem, I think it'd, uh, it'd cut the target area down. <laughs> Hey, I think it is um, an issue. Okay. Sorry. No, carry on, Jim. <laughs> I think it is an issue. You know, it's something that we should look at if we are going to have to go down a flail route. Is that you're you're actually spraying half of the chemicals landing on black soil? You know, I think a a band spraying uh, after a after a flail is something that we we should look at. Uh, because you want to target the, you only want to target the ridge, uh, so that you're putting a blight product on to prevent tuber blight. But I think, and that's one advantage of uh, a non-flail spray. Everything's hitting the target. Perfect. I've got a question here. Um, so in the first part part of the desiccation webinar, so the one we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a comment from Scotland that perhaps there were differences in the amount of regrowth seen with different blight fungicides used in conjunction with the desiccant. Um, has there been any more um, information on this? 
Um, th there were two treatments with different uh, different partner products in, and there was definitely one uh, head and shoulders above the other. Uh, we haven't got an answer, but certainly everybody's working together uh, to find out what's happening there. We saw it five or six years ago. It, it seemed to cause a difference in the level of blackleg uh, in a mooring crop, uh, but we really don't know the reason why. Uh, but as soon as we know, well, uh, everybody's looking at it. All right, thanks, John. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, we, we, we had this discussion in formulating the treatment plan for 2019 about uh, potential for Infinito uh, potentially protecting, you know, against other diseases, um, you know, that might come into the crop. So Infinito uh, versus Ranman, and, and Ranman contains a, a wetting agent which might have an advancing effect on the crop in terms of desiccation. And my own view was, were we testing desiccation products or fungicides as desiccants? And so we had to include it, but the contrast we had of two treatments was Ranman and Shinkon with the same Spotlight, Gozai, Spotlight treatment plan. And there were no significant differences between either of those two blight products in terms of efficacies of kill. But the differences are likely to be small, and so fungicide is probably far less important than the product that you're using to, to do the desiccation. So that's just an update on all of the four trials from last year where we tried Shinkon with non-wetter versus Ranman with wetter. Perfect. We're at half past four now, so um, I'm just going to ask one last question and then I'll ask for any closing comments from any of our speakers. Um, how much extra cost have the panel incurred for desiccation this season? Don't have to be specific, but uh, I'll throw that one out there. <laughs> we, we've probably, well, yeah, we've definitely saved because we've cut out one pass and, uh, and the dire court, everything else was the same for us. Um, probably slightly slower application rates with the higher water volume, so I haven't sat down and worked it out yet. We have an extra. We have an extra spray. Uh, so there's the cost of the the extra spray, uh, but not it's not as significant. Flailing's quite a costly operation up here. It's around uh, seventy five pound a hectare. I think it is. So it's it's a it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> Certainly for us, we've seen an increase in uh, in cost. Because prior to this, we were just solely chemical based, and jumping from that into flail, obviously we had to run, we had to run that flail and also depreciate it, uh, repair it, and uh, everything like that. Um, and that's certainly going to be more than our um, diequat bill. Um, what that is going to end up, I was basically going to wait to the end of the season actually just see um, on its own costs. I sort of like formulate our full cost. Um, profile, but it's it's been a definite increase. We would be very much um, in line with where we've been historically. We've um, we've flailed for a long time. It's been part of our strategy in, um, for a lot of years. So um, we've had very very little follow up um, applications to deal with commercial crops um, this year. So we we'd be very much in line where we've been historically cost-wise. Okay, brilliant. Um, I'm going to go down the line and just see if there are any um, extra bits you want to throw in or any other comments you want to make um, before we wrap things up for today. So if I start with Ollie, because you're next to me on the cameras. <laughs> um, I'd just say, yeah, it, of all the things, we sort of worried about it quite a lot last year and on the back of the trial work we did, we sort of gained a bit of confidence uh, coming out at the end of last season with increasing the water volumes and, and the job that could be done without diaquat. So, um, yeah, we've been pleased. It hasn't been as sort of traumatic as I thought it might have been at one point. So, it's good news. That's promising. <laughs> uh, Jim? Yeah, I think that uh, there's definitely things to look at variety wise. I think there's we have we need more attention to detail uh, how we we challenge the how we tackle each individual crop uh, and variety. 
uh, I think there's more decision making in, in that. From planting time, it's just attention, attention to detail all the way down the line. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I think it's been encouraging to see how well we've coped in the absence of Dyquat. I think the only slight caveat is that weather has certainly played, I think, quite a significant part in terms of the decades we've achieved this season, certainly in this part of the country. Um, so I think it's to yeah, avoid complacency really going into next season. And I agree with Jim. I think we need to do further work in terms of assessing um, you know, plant nitrogen levels, pre-estation. You know, I think that nutrition remains a significant part of this process. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, yeah, um, I'm pretty agree fully with uh, Mike and Jim. Really, there is, as far as nutrition, I think could well be part of the key to this. Um, I would say, though, as well, I'm pleasantly surprised actually of, of the results of flailing. Now, whether that be different in a different year with different weather circumstances on the southland, um, but uh, yeah, on the world, I'm not going to say before, I'm not too worried. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's basically where we are. Um, the only other thing I would just say is basically, obviously, potato harvest can be dangerous. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks very much, Will. <laughs> um, and Mark. Yeah, I think it's, it's we're all looking at this timing, and, and Jim said it's about application, application, application. And we've, we've talked about water volumes, we're talking about concentrating the spray by band spraying. I think there's a, a lot more we could test there in terms of we've got a product, let's learn how to use it better. We're faced with it for at least a decent while, we hope, um, with using old, maybe old school technology. But the one thing that we could be looking at is, is whether we could target tiers of leaves. In other words, we take layers down with very perhaps dilute concentration initially where we're hitting, as Jim said, the whole target. And as we get deeper into the canopy, maybe then we should be looking at that potentially band spraying to target stems or the, you know, the bottom leaves, which are difficult to kill from that first or second pass. So it's sort of looking about managing it. Maybe intervals need to be shorter than our traditional seven days. You need to look at the crop perhaps a little bit better. But one thing I would add is that we keep looking at canopy um, in terms of the determinant of skin set. And, and I will add to what I said last year, more the results is the skin set that's occurring underneath isn't a good indicator of what's happening above ground. And what might be happening below ground might be much slower or more rapid. So I think we do need a way of assessing skin set better that growers can do. Thumb, thumbnails, pressure are all a good guide, but I think it would be good to get a better quantitative thing so we can add numbers to what we're doing in terms of changing the treatments above our ground. Perfect, brilliant. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to uh, all of the speakers and everybody that's dialed in today. Um, I hope you've got something useful from it. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Christian. Uh, so just to wrap up, when you come off the webinar, there'll be a survey. Um, if you could just fill it in and uh, any comments are always greatly appreciated. It helps us to improve the service that we're providing. Um, as I said at the beginning, this webinar has been recorded. So if you've missed anything or you want to watch it again, I'm sure you will do, then uh, find it on the HDB Potatoes YouTube channel. Um, there are my details. If you've got any further questions, feel free to drop me a line um, and I can try and answer them. Um, and then I think if you click it, there we go. Uh, the next webinar that we've got coming up is on the 21st of October um, and it's the latest in storage and a harvest roundup. Uh, so put it in the diary. Uh, but just a big thank you from me um, and I hope to see you all in a webinar or face-to-face -face, uh, again soon. Thanks very much.